Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thank you again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Garo Saradarian, who teaches in both the Masters of Music in Music Education program and the Composition and Theory departments at the Longy School of Music, as well as also being a lecturer uh, at MIT. Uh, so Garo, welcome to the show. Hi, Erin. Nice to be here. So it's so great uh, to have you on the show. And of course, the Longy School of Music is one of our wonderful creative partners. We've co-created uh, and co-curated this show with them. Uh, and so there's really some important work that you are doing uh, at Longy, and especially related to theory. And I thought this would, you know, this would really be a great um, you know, episode and opportunity to talk about theory. Um, and like many things in our field, we have tended to do things and or teach things in a very similar way for decades or longer. Um, and of course, in theory, there's certainly a very, you know, white Eurocentric um, history and framing uh, of music. So I thought I would just start off right by just tossing that out there to you and to get your sense of, you know, kind of how theory has been taught and, um, and how you view it today. Sure. Um, yeah, let's see where to start. Um, <laughs> uh, well, Longy sort of, it, it came together out of this mix of different different people at Longy really thinking about, uh, like you said, the, the the Western centering of of music theory, um, the president, Karen Zorn, um, Jeremy Van uh, Buskirk, um, and Alexander uh, Dubois, who's the uh, composition chair. And they've sort of been tossing this idea around a lot, um, especially with um, what has been happening outside of the conservatory walls in terms of Black Lives Matters um, and discussions about race in America. Um, it really gave some sense of urgency to put these discussions in action. And uh, so last June, um, Alexandra, myself, and um, Anna Wang, who's uh, also on, on the faculty at Longy, um, came together as a committee. Um, and it was just this thrilling, intense, joyful work where basically for a month, we decided to just revamp all of the theory curriculum and uh, really disrupt, you know, centuries of, of how theory was thought, uh, taught. Um, because as I'm sure most of our, our viewers know, who've been through a, a Harmony course, um, you know, all the constructs of how you listen to music, um, how you look at it, how you theorize about it is all basically, um, not only is it Western, but it's really just Western, Western Europe, right? And then even within that little slice, it's the past 300, 400 years. Um, so it's a narrow of a narrow of a narrow vision of what music is and how people make music and how people think about music. Um, and so what we uh, did and are still doing because we see this as an iterative process, right? This is something that's, you know, the Western frame of music has been so entrenched that it's not gonna just be done with, you know, a month of committee meetings. Um, but as an iterative process, we, we created this curriculum where uh, we've de what we call decentered the Western paradigm. So it's not throwing the Western ideas of theory out, but it's saying it's just one out of many, many, many ways that human beings have responded to music. Um, and that really was our focus is, is how do humans respond to music and how is that reflected in different cultures? Um, so we sort of picked different ways of how cultures do look at music. So the curriculum as it is now um, starts with uh, a class called critical pedagogy, or sorry, critical methodologies, um, which includes critical pedagogy. But the idea is to look 
at how music has been taught and how we've sort of been habituated to listen in a certain way. And so that the students really get this critical lens in terms of when they read about theory, or when they read a textbook, um, when they think about how they grew up listening to music and how certain music was seen as the norm um, and other music was seen as, you know, exotic or, or, or primitive or, you know, all these uh, labels that, that were put on them. Uh, and then there's a four semester sequence where we focus on what we call lenses. So lenses for looking at music. Uh, one lens is improvisation and notation. Uh, and we thought that was really important to start with improvisation because all music is improvised <laughs> before it's written down. That's where it comes from. Um, and one of the Western frames is this idea that music is this object that is written down um, and that must be interpreted in a certain way. And really, even within the history of Western music, you know, we forget that Bach was as famous, if not more, as an improviser than as a, a composer. Um, but especially just having students become comfortable with the idea of improvising in different cultural ways, with different scales, with different modes, macams, with different rhythm, uh, rhythmic systems. And also think about notation and how when you notate something, ine inevitably you leave something out um, and what gets left out and what doesn't get left out and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of notation. Um, then we have a temporality uh, lens, which focuses on uh, different ways basically that time and beat and duration is organized by different cultures. Um, and then we have uh, one for pitch. So how is pitch organized? And then I think this, in addition to the improv, is, is really, I think, really a, a far-looking lens, which is instead of doing harmony, we decided to call it ways of coming together. Because the way we were thinking about it on the committee is music is about people coming together, right? rituals, dance, celebrations, funerals, um, big life events. So we decided with this lens to look at harmony and form as a bigger picture of how people come together to make music, how different levels of music create texture, and get away from this idea of, you know, Roman numeral analysis as being, um, you know, the reification of harmony. And then we did a lot of thinking about avoiding the sense of this becoming sort of just a buffet where you go and you sort of taste different musical cultures and not really respect the individuality of those cultures and of those musics. And we wanted to avoid this idea of non-culture bearers talking about other music. And I think that's a really important, not only in terms of music theory, but in, uh, in fields like ethnomusicology, where you often have white uh, professors teaching music of other cultures, um, having not been culture bearers of that music. And so we thought for the final semester, what we wanted to do is students get to take a deep dive with a cultural practitioner of a certain musical genre and study with that person. Um, and so we wanted to fold that into the process so that this is in keeping with the idea of in inclusivity, right? So we're not just being inclusive in terms of the repertoire. We're not just being inclusive in terms of um, the different lenses, but we're being inclusive in terms of how do you teach these musics, right? If you're teaching a music that comes from a certain culture where the performance practice is different, you don't want to be teaching it in a Western way. Um, you know, I always find it odd when, for instance, um, you know, choirs sing music, say, from Ghana, and everyone's dressed in a tuxedo and, you know, in a concert hall and the lights are dark and no one can talk and no one can clap. And that's not how 
music, and I'm just using Ghana as an example, but that's not how most music in the world is experienced, is in a silent concert hall. So we want to also make sure the students get this idea that there are different ways of teaching music, there's different types of music, there's different ways of experiencing music, and we want to make sure that they understand that we're expanding their experience not so that they feel like they're experts in all these fields, but so that they can have that broader experience. And if they decide to then go and study with someone on a deeper level from that musical culture, they can do that. Um, and we felt that was really important to include in the curriculum. And we felt it was really important too, and Lanji was really supportive about this, is that there would be professional development for the faculty from cultural representatives who are, you know, being adequately um, um, paid and respected. Um, and that that's an ongoing process. So that when I teach improv and notation, for instance, there are some topics that I do have experience with that I have had private instruction with, and there's others I don't. Um, and that's okay, as long as I acknowledge that. And with this professional development, together sort of as a team, right, um, make this leap towards um, theory that's more inclusive. Right. Um, well, that was a lot to say. But right, <laughs> yes. Well, that, that's what is so fantastic. And I was like, you know, just I just needed to sit back so that I could hear because I think this is really just um, such important work um, and and it's fascinating and and it's also really, you know, at this cusp where, you know, there a lot of people in the field are talking about it, but not everyone is actually doing something about it. Um, and one of the things I love that you mentioned about, because a lot of times people have pushback and saying, oh, you're just doing away with, you know, all of this, you know, uh, a way that we've understood and structured music for, you know, centuries, et cetera, but that that's not what it is, that it is, it is additive, it, additive, it is putting into context rather than just having this soul centric focus um, on a particular time window and geographic window um, and stylistic window. So I think it's it's really um, phenomenal and important work. Um, and so one thing I wanted to just ask too, so we have a lot I think in our audience who are like, ah, and saying, okay, maybe we should do this. And or especially students in our audience are like, I wish my school was doing this right now um there is you know still and i don't know if you experienced it at all at, at Lanji, but some pushback right to this type of, of evolution did you either encounter that and or any suggestions that you would have for those in our audience who are saying we want to do something similar uh but we're finding resistance or opposition mm -hmm. yeah um Lanji was just incredibly supportive of it. And I think, you know, part of it is a, it's a small school. And, you know, when, if, if, if the president, you know, and the deans and, and, and the chairs want to change something, it's, it's easy to do that because there's not a lot of levels of, of administration. So I could see how it could be more difficult, you know, in a, in a large university where the music department's part of a huger um, organization. Um, and I like how you mentioned the students too, because this really also came from the students, you know, meeting with um, uh, the president, meeting with um, Alexand Alexandra and, you know, saying, you know, we want this. We, we don't want to keep doing the same thing. Um, in terms of how to put this into practice, I would say that, you know, the, like you mentioned, the important thing is we're not getting rid of something. And I think that's important when, 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 initiating this process is that it's a decentering it's not a uh, dismantling right it's saying that no music should be held as the norm from which everyone else is subordinate right it's saying that there should not be a a role model of what ideal music is so we're not getting rid of western music if anything we're enriching it by bringing in these other perspectives that have been shut out right exactly. um absolutely yeah. Absolutely. So awesome. So unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always like to ask all my guests 
Um, you know, there's uh, I'll, in this work, I'm sure there are days where it might be tough or certain obstacles seem like they can't be, you know, overcome. And curious, as you've kind of experienced not just this process, but all of your, your leadership, um, what do you do? Where do you find inspiration for yourself? Where do you kind of, what do you draw upon for that strength when times are the toughest? That's a good question. Um, I love books. I love reading. Um, it's always sort of been my my sanctuary is, um, you know, ever as a, since a little kid, you know, my father had, you know, a little section of, of the room as a library is to just go there and browse and read through um, books. Um, and I find, you know, at the end of the day, that that's what I do. I, I, I go to my library and um, I love history books. Um, it puts things in perspective because uh, when you read history, there's, you know, we don't have it so bad <laughs> uh, compared to other periods. Um, I mean, and that's not to downplay, you know, the very real struggles and um, issues of today. But, you know, there's been some times in history when things have been rough. Yeah. And so put some perspective in things and, you know, reading about how people made it through through those times, I think gives hope and, um, you know, some guidance for, for the times we live in. So. Awesome. Well, Garo Saradarian, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our field. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Aaron. It's been, it's been great. Thank you.